I was kind of like, you know, and I remember I went through like this rough era of like, you know, I was sleeping on my man's couch Mm -hmm. and living off of, you know, you know, ramen, 99 cent crazy bread from Little Caesars and and bags of marshmallows if I wanted, if I had a sweet tooth. You want to touch that tooth? Yeah. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Inside Hilton's Head, where, you know, I talk about the things that are on my mind. And uh, what's been on my mind is uh, thinking about the things in life that uh, we tell ourselves we are, mm-hmm. right? Uh, the things that we strive to be when we're younger and we're saying that we're going to be this thing. And if we're not that thing, then um, we're not worthy of certain things in life. So we chase and chase this thing. Um, and I feel like I've had many lives uh, chasing, uh, whether it's being a filmmaker, a fine artist, at this point, a designer. Um, today, I have one of my favorite people. And I'm just saying people across the board. Um, here in my home, for one, but as a guest on the podcast, um, Stro Elliott, Stro, thank you for being here. And before we get into you speaking, because I don't want people to hear your voice before they hear my, <laughs> before they hear me talk about you, because then I'll be like, "Ooh, give me more of him." Um, <laughs> but uh, Stro is uh, one of my very, very great friends. Uh, Stro, uh, Maestro. Um, sh- stroll the 89th key. I'm not wow. sure if you go by that still. Ooh, we're doing that. Um, okay. I feel like that's kind of where I met Stroll. Stroll, uh, who you probably all do know, but if you don't, Stroll is one of the members of the Roots crew, and he is uh, playing Monday through Friday uh, with that group of wonderful individuals on The Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon. And uh, to me, I mean... A round of applause. I don't know if they're going to put that in the edit where they have that <laughs> round of applause, but I'm sure so many people are clapping. And I know for a fact, for me, every time I see you on the show, I kind of stand up and give an applause. But okay. Stro, I do want to welcome you to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm actually really excited to be here. Like, you know, we, we talked a little bit when I first showed up. Like, we haven't spoken in a minute. Like, at least not, it wasn't like through you know, an app or for sure. or just random text or whatever. So it's good to, number one, just to see you. Yes, sir. And, Same. and to speak with you. And then be inside your beautiful home or, you know, <laughs> or what, what is at least like the origins of like your, you know, your, 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 your weird villain story. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You know what? It's, uh, and I guess we'll get into this, but it is um, one of the chapters of my life at this point, right? Yeah. The, the green thumb version of myself who you get to meet right at this point in time so i'm very thankful that you're here and like you said we haven't uh chopped it up we haven't sat across from each other i would uh, i'm gonna say in four years right before the pandemic we kind of met up yeah Yeah, i was on i was on my first book tour Mm -hmm. and we met up in brooklyn and had um a bite to eat and we kind of had this discussion that's kind of why i wanted you to be on this podcast because while you are on the tonight show now and you're Mm -hmm. a part of the roots When I first met you um, back in 2000, I believe 2004, maybe it was late 2003, but 2004 is, I believe, is like when we first met. Um, You were uh, a member of a group called The Percussions. Mm -hmm. And you guys were pretty big um, in my eyes. Hmm. Um, I was out in California um, in film school, Mm -hmm. um, trying to get a master's in film. And uh, I was thinking about what I was doing in my own life, trying to be a filmmaker. Uh, and I had met you and the rest of the uh, crew from the percussions. And the reason why we had met is because your manager at the time mm-hmm. had, I guess, gotten wind that I possibly might be available to be a tour manager. Mm-hmm. <laughs> now, I hadn't done any sort of managing any tours before this, but right. I was in college and I could take some time off and just go on the road. Right. And when I met you, I knew instantly that you were just a good dude. Mm. You know, like you have these moments as an adult, you know, I was 24 at that time and I met you and I was like, this guy is a good dude. I could tell you had 
had great, like a great upbringing. Mm -hmm. Um, And I wanted to make sure that I spent more time around you because there was, it was rare to me to meet someone like that (laughs) in California. I I mean, Los Angeles, I was, I was fairly new to Los Angeles and I wanted to um, talk more to you about just who you are. Now, our guests on the podcast, maybe, maybe, maybe many of them don't know who you are. So sure. I want to get into that. And that's why I really love uh, having you here today so that we can kind of go through some of the things that I, honestly, some things I don't know much about right. uh, you and, and maybe some of your history. Right. Um, but I want to talk about that, that shift because while you have, you've stayed the course, but there's peaks and valleys mm-hmm. And you had this dream, and maybe I don't. I want to know: Was this a dream of yours? Mm-hmm. You are a drummer first. Would you call yourself a drummer first? Ooh. What was the first instrument you you ever played? Um, wow. Well, I mean, if you go to my childhood, like it could have been, <laughs> you know, like anything. Like I just liked music. Um, but my first official instrument, the first instrument that someone bought me that my parents bought me when I decided okay I want to join the school band was trumpet trumpet okay Uh, yeah and I played trumpet for what four or five years um now I grew up a military brat so we moved like um quite a bit growing up so I started playing trumpet in middle school um and by the time I got to high school uh my father got his orders and we moved to Germany Oh wow! Uh, when we moved, we're to Germany, in Germany. Uh, the first time, the first time when I was younger, this was before high school. We lived in Nuremberg. You moved to Germany twice. Twice, yeah. Okay, Nuremberg. Nuremberg. When I was like eight years old or something like that. We was moved. was this when there was still East and West? I think so. Really? I think so. Okay. Yeah. Where's Nuremberg? East Nuremberg, or was it the oh, East side or West side of? I, at this point, I don't even remember. Okay. Like, it okay. Wasn't like I was. Studying geography at eight years old. <laughs> um, you should have been. I should, yeah, I should have been. <laughs> absolutely. Um, but I know the second time we was was a little bit more interesting because we lived uh, we lived pretty far from everything. My, my father made it a point to say, okay, instead of living on base and living on the barracks where we're around, yeah. it just feels like we're in kind of like this glorified projects. Little America. Exactly. You know, yeah. um, He's like, he, let's live out in the economy. Let's live, let's get a house. And, you know, and he found, I don't know how, how he found these people. There's a, a German couple who, has mm-hmm. a, who had a daughter who literally spent um, years renting out to American, you know, soldiers, American awesome. like families or yeah. whatever. Um, their daughter spoke a little English. Um, so so that was that was a plus. He kind of ran the local like brewery slash whatever, <laughs> which was great for my dad. Be a gotten. So you be a gotten. <laughs> Um, lots of low and brown in the kitchen. Nice. Uh, Pilsner and all, like oh, like just random stuff. But then also like he had like, you know, a little orange juice and apple juice things and like okay. kind of like this this weird concoction of like orange soda and Coca-Cola like situations that he would give us. It was great. It was perfect for us. Um, uh, and that was closer, I want to say, to like Bamberg. Again, don't ask me where that is. I went to high school in a <laughs> city it up, called. Guys. <laughs> yeah. I went to a high school in a city called Würzburg and my father worked in a city called Kitzigan. Okay. Yeah. So we were. I know all that one. I know that one. Do you? I don't. I was okay. just. Uh, just want to make you feel comfortable here. Uh, continue. Uh, look, my wife, born and raised uh, until she was twelve. I, in I just Germany. listened to the Valentine's Day. I was, and, was, and I heard her mention that she was German. Yeah, so yeah she like, grew okay. up in uh, Hamburg, and then she moved to uh, Dusseldorf. Dusseldorf. Yeah, Dusseldorf. Yeah, yeah. yeah, Dusseldorf. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we have, I've played there, but don't know much about Dusseldorf. It's a nice. It's a nice. Uh, part of Germany. I've been to a few cities in Germany since meeting her. Okay. Um, I'm actually really into Dusseldorf. Yeah. No, but this isn't about me. This is about you, brother. So, <laughs> so okay. So you're telling me you're you're in high school. So you're 14, 15. I mean, yeah, yeah. I'm in high school. Still playing trumpet in Germany. Still playing trumpet, and we moved to Germany, and they kind of it took them a while to get my papers, or in terms of like you know whatever. Um, Hold what, on. Where were you born? I was born in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Brother from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, moving to uh, Germany. Now, I'm not going to just go ahead and guess that uh, there were the same amount of people that looked like us in Milwaukee and also <laughs> in Germany. But You'd be surprised. Really? Oh, Milwaukee is... No, listen. Like, people think Green Bay when they think Milwaukee. <laughs> You're right. That's Milwaukee's what I'm not Green I'm Bay. literally thinking Green Bay. Milwaukee is, <laughs> Milwaukee is closer to Chicago than Green Bay in terms of its... True. Um, Very true. Um, but no, no, born in Milwaukee, probably 
you know, less than a year of me being alive, my father joined the military. Okay. Um, and, you know, immediately we hit the road. We, we, you know, his first orders, I think, were in Hawaii, which is where my brother would eventually be born. Wow. We live in, we lived everywhere in all regions of the U.S. except the East. We didn't okay. live, like this. It's funny that it, it took 40 plus years for me to live on the East Coast. <laughs> um, but yeah, we lived in Germany twice. You know, like I said, once, you know, before the age of 10. For sure. Uh, and then again, when I hit like my middle teenage years, we were out there. So um, now you're in high school now I'm in playing high the trumpet. School, playing trumpet. They didn't are get you, my papers. Are you any, are you fl not fluent, but can you have conversations in German? Oh, nine, next. Oh, okay. <laughs> like like I, I, I spoke it much better then because they, they made it, they kind of made it mandatory when you were in, when, when I was there the first time, mm -hmm. when you're in elementary school, they For make sure. it a point to teach you German. That's the best time yeah. to teach kids a different language. For sure. Um, and I held on enough, you know, to be, you know, eins, zwei, drei, vier, fünf, sechs, you know, to like count and say some of the alphabet and say, <laughs> and, you know, and all the pleasantries and whatever. Okay, so you were, you were in this place where you could get around mm -hmm. with, the, with, with, you, with the, yeah. I guess, knowledge of German that you knew. Yeah. You're playing trumpet at home or in school? I'm playing in school. Like, okay. you know, I get to school and uh, like I said, they didn't have my paper, so they didn't know what I played. And I had always wanted to play drums. Oh. And so I lied. Look at you. And told them, oh, I'm a drummer. Hold up. So because you're telling me that you always wanted to play drums, was your dad like, you're going to play the trumpet and that's what no. you're going to do? So why couldn't you switch to drums earlier? No. Well, listen, you know, my whole interest in music was so foreign to my family. Like, I don't have any musicians in my family. But was, was, but was there a lot of music being played in your was home? A lot. Oh, yeah. What yeah, kind yeah. of music? Um, a little bit of everything. Like the the greatest thing about my father's record collection was, it was mostly soul, you know, kind of like contemporary jazz, um, funk stuff mm -hmm. like that. But there would be like one Beatles record, one Carole King Ooh, record, okay. one you know one Led Zeppelin record. Yes. You know what I mean? Like, and that was enough for me because I was always in his records to be like, okay, I found this one Joni Mitchell record. What else did she make? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I found this one Led Zeppelin. What else did he make? Got it. Um, and so that was enough for me to kind of peak my in, into going off into whatever, you know, other genres that I wanted to in, in these other artists. But yeah, mo mostly soul, funk, jazz stuff or whatever. Um, but um, but yeah, they knew nothing. Like, I, I feel like the day that I told them that I wanted to go to school for music, I, I could have told them that I wanted to be an astronaut. <laughs> I could have told them, like, you know, whatever. Like, just, When was this? This was this was much later. Like I think we didn't have that discussion until probably end of my junior year of high school, like senior year. You were like, I'm all in. I was like, this is what I want to do. And but I, I was all in to a point. I was never a hundred percent on anything, just because, you know, part of growing up as a military brat, and and I, and this is where I tell people I'm a I'm a quintessential like military brat kind of through and through. I know uh I know very little about a whole lot of things without knowing a whole lot about any of those things in particular. <laughs> so in the same way that I've been to a lot of different places, for sure, I couldn't tell you like the ins and outs of all these cities, but Got I've it. been there. Yeah, you know of what I course. mean. Um, and I think every military brat is probably that way. You know, hit me up if you are that way. <laughs> I want to confirm that. Um, Put in the comments. Shout out to my man. Yeah, yeah, to know. the military brats, that military brat lifestyle. Um, but. Uh, uh, you know, but yeah, I didn't, I, they didn't have my paperwork. I lied. I said that I, you know, that I played drums because I always wanted to play drums. Um, my parents were, weren't, I don't know if they weren't against me playing. Well, let me, let me change that because I think there was a point that I brought up drums and there was an immediate fight back on that. Too noisy, which, too loud. Too loud, yeah. yeah. Which to me, trumpet didn't feel much different. Like it's literally <laughs> the sound that wakes up soldiers in like the fifties. Like, like, where y'all gonna let me hold a, a trumpet, but not drums? Uh -huh. um, and it wasn't like I wasn't still making noise. Like I was making makeshift drums out of like cans of pennies as a hi hat and like buckets as a Look kick and like, you know, like you. you know, and still making noise around the house. So they might as well have given me a drum uh -huh. kit. But you know, um, but they they allowed a trumpet. And, you know, I played, like I said, for about four or five years, and I was good at it. I was first chair trumpet player the majority of the time that I played. First chair. Well, my um, boy, first chair. Yeah. <laughs> what y'all know about that? I don't even know what that means. <laughs> it means that there's a there's a hierarchy. There's a, you know, um, if you have, you know, you have, you know, a group of clarinet players. A group you got of seven whatever, chairs. You got seven chairs. You're number one? Yeah. So there's you, seven chairs of trumpet players. Yeah. 
You're the number one. You all chair. play, and the and the and the director decides where you sit. Copy. And um and so for the most part, I was first chair. And when I moved to Germany, the same audition process was in effect. But since I lied and said I played on drums, I didn't do that in trumpet. And I moved over to the drums. And uh, what chair are you? Seventh chair? Because in yeah. drums, yeah, I don't oh, know. In drums, it was weird that in drums there didn't seem to be that same hierarchy. And I think it was just because I was because everyone could I, just bang on some drums. Well, it was the the clientele of the drummers that who were there. <laughs> God oh. love them, but they were just it was just a riff raff of just some of them didn't really take it serious. For sure, you know, um, For sure. It was just like yeah, I can hit some stuff. <laughs> like, you know, like, like, yeah, give me that, give me that. And that was me. I was a I was a drummer in, in uh, middle school. Yeah, because uh, I was like I can bang on some things. Exactly, and yeah. that was definitely at least a couple of them. And there was okay when I. When I first got there, there was maybe like five or six people back there. For sure. Because it's a military town, specifically, and it's a military situation, people were always coming and going. And sure. so, um, you know, at a later point, that becomes relevant. But it, it, the moment that they got my papers, I was probably back there for like two or three months. And he liked me as a drummer. I was good and that I paid attention. I could obviously read music and read rhythm um, because I played trumpet. And he was like, it says here that you were a trumpet player. <laughs> It says not only that you were a trumpet player, but you were a first chair trumpet player. <laughs> you damn lying American. And he was like, but he was cool about it. He was like, listen, you can continue to play drums if you want because you're good enough. Um, but do you want to switch the trumpet? Like, or whatever. Like, you yeah. know, there was like, and not even exaggerating, it felt like there was like 20 trumpet players. Like, the trumpet players lined the back of the room, like, in like, in kind of like this, like, curve. No, but there's only one, one chair, number one chair. Yeah, yeah. So there's and that could have been you, bro. And, and so he was like, "Do you want to play trumpet?" And I was like, I, "Do you want me to play trumpet?" And he was like, "He's like, I tell you what, play trumpet for a little while, and we'll see how it goes or whatever." And so the the process was this is okay. how they did it. You would start at the bottom. Okay. You would start at like so if there was twenty of them, you would start at the twentieth trumpet player, and you'd be like, "Play this piece." He would play the piece, and then you'd go to number nineteen and be like, "Play this piece." If number twenty played it better than twenty, he would be like, "Switch chairs." For sure. And if that guy would have, so I started at the bottom. Yo, that creates real beef, like live, right Absolutely. there. Absolutely. <laughs> like, we're in high school I'm where beef in this was chair. born. Like, <laughs> you know, so yeah, it was it was a little stressful because I'm like, I don't know any of these kids. For you sure. Know, whatever. And the first day he was having these auditions, I went from 20 to 19, 19 to 18. Same day. Same day. Look at this kid. I got all the way up to two. The same day. The same day. I got all the way up to number two. And there was a so yeah. at that point you have eighteen enemies. Yes, <laughs> yes. I, like, eight, I just got here. I'm trying to be. I'm trying to make friends. I'm just trying to live. You know. Come I on. Just, <laughs> you know, like you know, let's. There's enough beef with the wall. Like, why are we doing this? <laughs> you know. Um, but I get all the way up to number two, and there's a there's this there's this female there's this girl who holds the number one spot and she's good. Yeah, man. And uh, and uh, he makes her play the piece. She plays it well. And then he asked me to play again. And I played the piece again. And then he says that only like the, the cringiest thing to this day that still bothers me. He goes, ah, we can't have a girl in the number one seat, Ooh, can we? Jesus. And I kind of look at him and I go, that's irrelevant. Yeah. But okay. Um, and he leaves her there, you know, you know, despite his weird comment, he, mm -hmm. he leaves her there. And I'm like, that's cool. Listen, I went from 20 to number sure. two. You know, in in an instrument that I haven't played in in months. You know what I mean. Real quick, are these all German kids? Or are these no, no, no. These are, I'm on base. It's a military yeah, yeah, kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got so it. So we're on base. Co copy that. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so you know, this probably went on for you know probably a month or so. Okay. Um, and then somebody, I don't know if you've seen the movie Drumline, but you you can have I people have challenge people. people, of course. And so somebody challenged somebody in the trumpet situation. Ooh. And that person moved up to. He was playing the game, uh -huh. moved up, and got all the way up to my position, to number two, and challenged me. I played. He didn't beat me. But now this was an opportunity for the teacher to go, Trumpet beast. Well, let's do this again. Let's have her play. Okay. Let's have you play. I played. You liked it. She played. Oh, you now I'm number one. one share. Here you go. And this girl's number two. Yo, my man went number one share in the U.S., <laughs> And then number one chair in Germany. You know what I mean? Like that that's who I saw when I first met you in 2004. I was like, yo, this is a number one chair type personality this, right here. But this is what was crazy. Probably, I was probably there, it felt like again for like maybe less than a month. Mm -hmm. And you know, 
the only real benefits of being the number one chair in in a high school band situation, maybe it's true in the other situations as well, is you get all the solos, you get, sure. you know, your parts are a little different, you know, or whatever. Everybody's parts are a little bit different, but you get kind of the more challenging parts depending. First, probably the first three chairs do. Yeah. Um, but I was there for a month, and like I said, it's military, so people are coming and going. Yeah. All of a sudden, he was down to not only just two drummers, but two of the most knucklehead drummers. <laughs> <laughs> like, so he's got basically no real rhythm section. And so he comes up to me one day, and he's like, listen, man, you know, uh, you're a first chair trumpet, so, I mean, obviously, you can stay there if you want, but sure. we, we kind of need a drummer. And I know that you're more than capable of. And I was like, yeah, let's do it. Yeah. I want to move back to drums. Cool. So I moved back to drums. And the way that he <laughs> kind of did it was because it was, you know, everything was kind of split up. And, you know, there was a couple snares, there's a kick drum here, whatever, but there was also a drum set. Yeah. And he was like, can you play drum set? And I was like, I don't know. Like, I've never been behind a drum set before. Got it. Like, or whatever. And he was like, all right, well, let's try it. We're going to do some tunes or whatever. Because this whole thing, he's like, he's like, I don't know if I trust either of them to play <laughs> kick or snare or crash cymbals or whatever, like, whatever. So if you can do the majority of it, like, and hold it down, like, that would be amazing. And so, basically, I got a crash course in learning how to play a drum kit. Because, okay. like, I was, like, sitting there and I'm reading the music. Like I said, I can read rhythm. And they were capable enough that they could, sure. you know, whatever. So I didn't have to do everything. For sure. Um, but, yeah, I, stuff, I sticked on, and I didn't, I never went back to trumpet. I was on drums pretty much the rest. So at this time. point, you are now considering yourself a drummer. Yeah. And then you decided you wanted to go to drum school. Or music so school. So this was probably, drums. I left Germany and moved back to the States, like, halfway through my junior year okay. of high school. When I got back to the States, we moved to Colorado, uh, specifically Colorado Springs, Colorado, where uh, Fort Carson, I think, is the base is. Um, and the first school that I went to, um, you know, I went there as a drummer. Okay. Um, and it was a little bit more involved, which I kind of like. They they were more they wanted you to be a little bit more well rounded. They were kind of preparing you for what it would be to be what it is in college, which is when you go to colleges as a as a you know, as a music major and specifically even in rhythm, you still have to learn piano. You yeah. learn how to play yeah. like xylophone and marimba and stuff like that. Sure. So, you know, um, and, you know, but they were teaching like, you know, world instruments, like hand mm -hmm. drums and stuff yeah. like that, which was really cool. Like, I, you know, I didn't realize that was even like a thing. They it's great to be exposed to all that stuff. Absolutely. Sure. Absolutely. And then in Colorado Springs of all places, it was like, what's going on here? Um, and so, uh, yeah, I did that. I was at that school for maybe like a couple months. Um, before transferring to another school once my parents found a house. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I switched to a, a high school there, and they gave me the option. They were like, okay, well, you can do concert band again, but there's other bands concert or whatever. Band. Okay. Concert band is you play classical, you play kind of the more like all that stuff. But, it's it. like, but I saw on the thing, I was like, I was like, what's show band? And it was like, well, it's like jazz. Like, Ooh, oh, you are, you like. Word, <laughs> yeah, let's do <laughs> that. Up, whatever up. that is, let's do that. Um, I was like, all right. So I remember my first day in class, I show up and, uh, you know, the band all files in and there's one drummer. I'd never forget this dude, this dude named Adam. Uh, it's a big dude, Adam, white kid, red hair, glasses. Uh -huh. And uh, and the teacher was like, he was like, he's like, oh, so you're a drummer. And I was still kind of reluctant. Like, I don't know how good everyone is. I don't For know sure. what this situation is. Maybe I still play trumpet, you know, whatever. Let's see. I was like, yeah, I'm a drummer. Yeah. You know, whatever. He's like, okay. Uh, he's like, well, let's do this. He's like, I'm going to have Adam here play through this Buddy Rich tune. And uh, I want you, you know, listen. If you don't know the tune, if you don't know, if you know the tune, great. And then I'm going to have you play through it just to kind of see where you're at. And so I sat there and it was a, it's a tune called Nutville. I'm sorry, what'd you say? The tune is called Nutville. 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 Copy that. Um, I'm not responsible for the name of this song. <laughs> I'm not sure the origins of this song and why it's called Nutville, if there is a place that is represented somewhere in the world that it, that it is known as Nutville. I don't know uh -huh. the origin of the name of the song, but it's called Nutville. But it's a very dope song. Like, I love the oh. song. As soon as I'm listening to it, it starts off with kind of this Latin feel. It's, it's an up-tempo joint. And it switches like like halfway through to like more of a, like a swing situation. There's like mm. a drum solo that kind of happens where they trade okay. towards the end, and I'm going, "Whoa, okay." There's a lot going on, but I'm kind of following. I'm watching Adam play, and Adam, God bless him, you could tell like he's like he's like sweating his way through it. He's like he's like this. He's like, dude, I'm barely a drummer. <laughs> I'm barely a drummer. 
I can kind of keep the pace or whatever, but you know, whatever. He's like, he's like, and he was always looking at me like, please be good. So I don't so, have so to do it. Yeah, yeah. You know, whatever. And so I get up to play. And you heard him. I heard him. So yeah. you knew you had this role because you were like, no, I'm better than him. Not necessarily okay. because, I mean, he knew the tune. I didn't know this tune, it, it, you know, <clears throat> you know, and he was capable enough. It wasn't like he was, you know, whatever, but I was going to sit down and do my version of it. You know what I mean? At the very mm-hmm. least. And I remember I played it, got through the, you know, the sections or whatever, and blah, blah, blah. So as we finish the song, whatever, get done and, and uh, look over at the band teacher and he was like, welcome. Nice. You know, and I look back at Adam and Adam was like, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and I pretty much became their drummer, you know, um, and this was the end of my junior year. Um, my senior year was kind of the, I was kind of officially the drummer and we where I got to be there the whole entire year. And in high school, they did this thing where you show up to these jazz festivals. They would have these jazz festivals where all the high schools in, in yeah. the state um, would show up. Um, and you get to play these festivals and there's awards that get handed out and stuff. And then uh, they also had this Allstate situation. You could try okay. out to be an all you know, to be an Allstate player. And it was two different bands. Um, there was one through four A, and then there was a five A, six A like class. Yeah, for sure. I was in the one through four A situation. And I can't remember how it was set up, like, but there was there was this school uh, called Coronado that had all the best players. Mm-hmm. I think they were like five A, six A. I could be wrong there. Um, and my school one through four A, in my school in particular, my band teacher made it a point to tell me, he's like, listen, no one's ever got selected to be a part of an all state situation at this school. Mm-hmm. I was like, really? You say, that's, hurt, chef. That's I got sad. You. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's sad. <laughs> it was more of a reflection on like, oh, the Oops program is really not one? Like, oh, man. This entire existence of this school is like, and this school has been here for a minute. And he was like, he was like, listen, if you get selected, because I think you have a good chance, man. Like, I'm a, I can't say much because I'm a teacher, but I, I want to get you something special. You know, and it ended up being like, he got me a nice, a nice drum bag with, with sticks in it and stuff. Like, it was cool. It wasn't, you know, anything over the top. But I remember I went to do the audition. I went with one of the other members of the band um, and did the audition, and it was it was it was nerve wracking. Yeah, you know, right. you're sitting in front of these people who've heard thousands of drummers from all these all schools. the weight of that school's history is on your shoulders now. And yeah, and I don't think it, that really registered until until I was leaving, where I was just kind of kind of going like, oh, I guess I'll wait to see if I got it for sure. They don't tell you for weeks, okay? Because you know they have to go through every it's the entire statewide search. And I remember, you know, two weeks later, sitting in class, and he's um, and he's reading off the list of the people who got chosen. Mm-hmm. And he goes, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And he goes to the other, the 5A, 6A school, and he's like, the drummer. And he reads off the name of the drummer. And I go, okay. And I thought that was it. I, did, I forgot that there was two separate classes or whatever. He starts reading out the no- name of the other band, and he gets, and he goes, drummer. Um, and he reads my name. Mm. You know, Sierra High School. That was the name of the high school that yeah. I went to. Balancing work and life can be really stressful, and finding ways to work through the stress is always a goal of mine. Of course, the process of nurturing plants helps me to slow down, take a breath, and bring in joy. But unfortunately, my plants aren't licensed therapists with expert advice. Regardless if you have a clinical mental health issue like depression or anxiety, or you're just a human who lives in this world who is going through a hard time, therapy can give you the tools to approach your life in a very different way. And that's why I'm excited to tell you about today's sponsor, BetterHelp. BetterHelp's mission is to make therapy more affordable and more accessible. And this is an important mission because finding a therapist can be really hard, especially when you're limited to the options in your area. BetterHelp is a platform that makes finding the therapist easier because it's online, it's remote, and by filling out a few questions, BetterHelp can match you to a professional therapist in as little as a few days. It's easy to sign up and get matched with the therapist. There's a link in my description. It's betterhelp.com forward slash Hilton. Clicking this link helps to support this channel, but it also gets you 10% off your first month of BetterHelp so you can connect with a therapist and see if it helps you. And because finding a therapist is a little like dating, if you don't really fit with that therapist, which is a common thing with therapy, you can easily switch to a new therapist at no additional cost without stressing about insurance, who's in your network, or anything like that. Starting this podcast was supposed to be a little extra therapy for me, getting the ideas in my head out. Good to know I can always use better help just in case Molly can't help me. So if you're struggling, consider online therapy with better help. Click the link in the description or visit betterhelp.com forward slash Hilton. Thank you again, better help for supporting this channel. 
and he reads my name. Mm. You know, Sierra High School. That was the name of the high school that yeah. I went to. You know, kids in the in the you know uh, in the class clapped. He presented me with this drum bag as a gift, and uh, yeah, it was really That's really awesome. cool. It was it was awesome. You know, and you know I went to, and it was dope because you got to miss a week of school to basically go play music for five days. Look Just, at that. You rehearse, and the whole idea is at the end of that five days, you do this show. For sure. Um, where you have, obviously, all the parents, but people are part of whatever music music community existed in Colorado Springs would come and watch these all-star cast of kids play. I love um, it. And it was great. It was fun. So you're, like, now deep in it. You are oh, a yeah. musician. You this, want to be this. Yeah, yeah. And Because this is, like I said, my senior year of high school, and I'm like, okay, yeah, what, whatever this is, what's the next level of this like what and what was the next level the next level was trying to go to school trying to go to college and be a music major got it um and so you know i did the thing where i i investigated as much as i could without knowing too much of course you kind of start at the top like okay what what's what are the schools that everyone talks about going to music you hear juilliard, juilliard for sure. you hear berkeley mm -hmm. um and so i was like all right i'll send off stuff to those <clears throat> And, you know, what are the other ones? North Texas was a really good school at the okay. time. Never heard of that. Um, for, you know, specifically for jazz. Okay. Um, um, if you were trying to be a jazz player. Um, as well as, like, some other schools. What uh, about the School of Hard Knocks? They weren't taking applications. <laughs> yeah. It's just not about just go out there. You have to knock really hard. <laughs> <laughs> and you were like, I want an easier path. In, in the, because, like, like what, is the, what is the ultimate goal at this point? As like as a drummer or as a yeah. musician, like what well, are you this thinking? This was the thing. I was so because there was so much I didn't know, both in what I kind of really wanted to do, and some of that had to do with the fact that I didn't really know myself yet. I, th mm, I think I just course. knew I liked music. Yeah, I didn't know in what capacity I wanted to be in music. I was just like, all right, well, I'm gonna keep doing this because it seems to be working. For sure. Like I'm playing drums, and people seem to like you know when I play. I've gotten accepted to this thing. I've won these awards and done these things. Cool. Let's continue doing this. Yeah. Um, you know, I applied to these schools. I think I might have got accepted to maybe USC and maybe North Texas was interested. Juilliard sent a letter. I don't, you know, and maybe that they wanted me to come visit the campus, but it, I don't think it was as serious as like, oh, you're accepted or yeah. anything. But it was like, um, but then there was also the thing I didn't think about as a kid was the money, you know, yeah. paying for these schools. Yeah. You know, Juilliard and the Berkeleys of the world are not cheap. Not at all. Um, you know, and the idea of traveling from Colorado to another state and being an out-of-state student was also not cheap. Mm -hmm. And so as much as I wanted to go to California, you know, at that point, it wasn't going to be a cheap thing for my parents to be able to afford. And, for you sure. know, so I applied for a scholarship and didn't get the scholarships that I applied for. Um, so, you know, the thing about it, the, the, the thing I had in my back pocket the whole time was that I knew that there was a school three, four hours north of Colorado Springs in Greeley, Colorado. Okay. The University of Northern Colorado that has a great music program, that has okay. a great jazz program. They're kind of world renowned. With, there was a guy named Gene Aiken um, who used to work there, who ran that department, and um, had won awards and was yeah. So you know that was there, um, but it was about me going up, doing the audition, and seeing if I got accepted. Okay. And I went up for one audition and I didn't get accepted, and but they allowed me to re audition, and I went up and re audition and got accepted the second there time. There we go. There we go. Um, Mostly because I think, you know, they didn't know what I was. I didn't know what I was in, in terms of what I wanted to do. They gave me the same music to everyone. But I think there was a there was a guy that sat under the uh sat under the main guy there mm -hmm. who I think just saw something in me. He was like, he's like, okay. He's like, I understand that you compose music as well. Like you don't just play. And I was like, Yeah, sure. a little bit. He's like, Can you in your next audition, can you play me something that you compose, like an original piece? I'm like, sure. <laughs> so I did that and kind of played that. And he was like, Okay, all right. Yeah. Tore it up. There's, there's something to kind of work with here. You For know sure. What I'm saying? Like we can kind of refine this, you know. So, you know, luckily that was the situation in me getting into the University of Northern Colorado, which I only did one year. <laughs> one year. So you were like, I got what I needed. I'm no, guessing. no, <laughs> that wasn't what. Well, I, they were my, like, I, we got what we needed. <laughs> well, I did my first semester, and I feel like it was, it was, it was funny that my mother was surprised. When she got that first report card, it was like pretty much straight A's and B's and, oh. and you know, whatever. And she's going, okay. Like, you know, like I did okay in school, mm -hmm. but I was never a straight A's and B's person. You know For what sure. I mean? Um, and so I think that kind of surprised her. And she was kind of like, okay. 
I guess this is what it looks like when you're doing something that you want to do. Yeah, yeah that you're into But it. the trick of it all, like at least at that school, is that when you first start at these colleges, you do you you do all your music stuff first. Your electives are something that you start to sprinkle in the for moment sure. that you're there. Yep. Um, so it was easy for me to look like a genius off the rip because I'm just <laughs> doing music classes. You know what I mean? Um, but on top of the fact that I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm into it. I'm taking it serious. The thing that changed is when I came home for the holidays. Back to Wisconsin. No, no, no. I was in oh, Colorado you're still Springs. In Colorado yeah. Springs. Got it. I came home for the holidays. Now I had ran. I had worked with some people that I had started making records with, and or just, you know, messing around with the idea of, you know, mm-hmm. you know, little songs here and there, making beats for people and whatever on my little Yamaha board. And, and while I was home for the holidays, I reconnected with these people, and mm-hmm. they're talking about, oh man, you know, can you make some, do this and blah blah blah? And I start messing with them, and we're making some things. Oh man, it sucks. You got to go back to school. So now I'm kind of mentally torn because I yeah. really liked what I was doing while I was home, and my second semester grades were terrible. <laughs> it was a re- it was definitely a reflection of the fact that I was kind of like, I really like kind of doing this other thing. Yep. That coupled with the fact that I was having conversations with these super seniors, people who were there who had been up in school for like five or six years, and uh-huh. they're going, and they're going, well, what do you want to do? Yeah, and I was like, I don't know. Like, he was like, well, he's like, well, first of all, what's your major? I was like, well, I'm a, I'm a music performance education combined performance education major. And they're like, do you want to teach? And I was like, not really. Yeah. And they're like, well, let me tell you what you're what you can do with a performance uh, degree, kind of what you're already doing. Yeah. You're performing already. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, unless you want to perform these specific things that they're teaching you or whatever. But he's like, so what else do you want to do? I was like, I don't know. I would like to learn the technical side of things, like the engineering. And he's like, yeah, they don't have that here. Mm. And I'm going, oh, so maybe there's a situation where I should maybe switch schools. And he was like, you should think about it at least, yeah. you know, and instead of wasting money and time here. Not that you couldn't still learn some incredible things here, but, you know, my thing was to just kind of drop out. For sure. Until I figured it out. Which Smart didn't make move. my parents happy. Of course my not. Mother, of course not. Because I moved back home. Um, and you well, know, I'm sure that kind of made them happy. But yeah. You yeah, being I mean, home, they were, but they sure. want, you know, obviously the, the idea of college then, yeah. probably still now in some sort of ways, like that's a great way to put yourself out there professionally as an exactly. adult. Exactly. So. On top of the fact that I was only maybe like the second or third child from my family to go to college oh so geez. it was like that so that was the thing so it yeah. was like you know and then to come home and be like oh i want to rap for a while it's like <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa what well this, so you came home from school and you decided that you want to be well, a rapper what i was doing during that semester during that break home that winter break was working with these other local mcs and rappers but i thought you were just making i was making music making beats no no yeah i was making music and making beats but it was for these rappers you know what i mean but were you rapping on not yet Okay. Yeah, but that to your parents, all they know is that you just you're a rapper. Yeah, you're coming sure. home and you're working with rappers. It's like I don't know what making beats means. You you <laughs> want to be a rapper? Yeah, you know what I mean. Um, so you know, all of that added together was probably whatever. And this was probably a good year or so before my parents would ultimately move back to Milwaukee, where they met, mm-hmm. um, where they were married, and where I was born. Um, and uh, I think it was an interesting transition because I made the decision to not go with them. The assumption was that I was going to follow them and go with them. And they were like, well, what are you going to do? Are you going back to school? No. I'm just going to stay. Yeah, I'm going to stay here and figure this out. Mm. You know, I don't know what it's going to be yet, if it's going to be sure. anything. But I've got these group of individuals that are creative and they want to make music. And I'm going to stay. Want to take this chance. Yeah. And it was really crazy for me. It was, it was the only time I see my father cry. Like it was, it was, it was to the point when it kind of messed me up because I'm like going, wow. whoa. Am I am, like am I fucking up here? Yeah. Like, what is what's going on like here? Like, they, like I've never seen that before. For sure. And you know they leave, and I remember that feeling. It was that that last episode of Fresh Prince of Bel Air. I'm sitting in the garage looking around, going, "Is this All it? Right. Is this it? <laughs> like, hold up. So, what, what, what have you had that conversation with your father? Yes, like, many times. So why was why were there tears? Why was there so much emotion? He explained point? it to me. Well, first thing that was interesting is that he said he was hurt. He was hurt by the fact that I wasn't going to go with them. I think he just assumed mm. that I was going to follow them because I think he viewed me coming back home after college and living there. It was like, oh, okay, he's back. Mm-hmm. Like he went and did this thing for a year and he came in, but he's back, yeah. you know, or whatever. Because low key, I think my father kind of always loved the idea, even though it was something that he didn't necessarily articulate, like the idea of having us all under one roof. Of course. You know what I mean? Like I have, I'm the oldest of three siblings. Okay. And, you know, um, 
to this day, if he if he could if he could afford it, he showed me blueprints of a dream, like two different dream houses he would build that we would all somehow you live still in. have a room, yeah, with yeah. your family as well, yeah. And he's like, well, we can make a studio, we can do all that. And yeah, I'm like, okay, Dad. Um, you know what? I'll tell you this, Joe, real quick. Uh, just sidebar. Yeah, my mom uh, still does that where I have a room in her house. Yeah, and. Um, up until three years ago, I'll say, I never understood and I thought it was so weird. Yeah. Like, why are you saving me a room? What's <laughs> right. wrong with you? Like, you think I'm coming back to just live with you with my, with my wife or something? Right. I didn't understand it until we had our child. Yeah. Is that at that point when you have this person, right. they're always that to you. Right. That special little baby. Yeah. And you want to make sure that they always have a home. Right. You know what I'm saying? So I love that about what and your that's dad was something thinking. that I I mean I don't have kids I'm not never been married or whatever so that's something I don't quite understand but I understand it through kind of a, like a level of osmosis where I watch my friends and my family my brother now having like four boys mm. and um and where I kind of I can kind of get it and that's why your dad is willing to build a studio in his exactly, home exactly exactly so For I'm you. sitting there looking at these blueprints going okay all right. I get, yeah. it. I get it, which is amazing. That's incredible. Like, you know, not not only to be thought about in that way, but I, I think I'm constantly in awe or I'm growing in awe in every day to realize the capacity that human beings have for love and the way that they have capacity for love. Even, you know, not only in the context of your family, yeah. but in the context of just people that you just, I mean, even just in even in our damn, damn dynamic and being just friends yeah. and the people that I have as my friends, I have a love for them that is kind of unexplainable. Like, yeah. like we're not we're not from the same place. We don't have the same origin story. We there's things about each other we did, we didn't, may not necessarily even like, but I love these people to death. Yeah, and I will go to war for them. You know what I mean? That's all due to your upbringing, your parents. So, and that's and like I said when we first started, like that's what I saw when I first met you. Got you. I could tell what your parents had instilled in you. Well, that's good because I had no clue what I was putting <laughs> out there. And Because when we first moved to Los Angeles, I know we're jumping around a bit. That's fine. When we moved to Los Angeles. When was this? This was 2000, ooh, 2002, 2003? Oh, so you got there right before I got right there. Right before you got there, yeah. Okay, so when you're saying we, you're saying we as who? We, the group, the percussions that I was in. So you had, you were in Colorado Springs. Your parents had moved back to Wisconsin. And well, to- and this jumping had a little bit. I was in Colorado Springs for about, total, I lived in Colorado for six years. Okay. For a little over six years. Um, the last probably two years, if not a little bit more of me being there, is when I met the guys that would become the percussions. And this is a hip-hop band that this you guys have formed. Band. Yeah. Um, and this is the band that I met you. When I met you, you were in this group. Yes. Right? So when did this band form? Ooh, uh, late 90s. Late 90s. Yeah. So when I met you, 2003, 2004, like we were mm-hmm. saying, let's say five years later, um, you had already been touring. You're like, you're like, <laughs> kind you're, of, kind, kind of. of. Okay. Like, we hadn't done our heaviest touring yet. Um, especially because, you know, like I said, there was no industry in Colorado Springs, Colorado. There's barely an industry in Colorado. It's much mm-hmm. different now, but at the time. Who's um, coming out of Colorado that you're like influenced by at this point? No one that I was influenced by, you know, but there were groups that were making noise. I think Tag Team is from there. Brotherhood Creed was a, was a group that was from there. Hold up, Tag of, Team, like Tag Team, yes. back again. I think maybe okay. one of the members is from there. There's other bands, Big Head Todd and the Monsters was was a band that was wow. from there. Never heard of that. Um, okay. There's probably some other bands that if I if I could sit down and like the whatever, but it had a scene. It just wasn't a scene that catered to us. For sure. You know, um, and so it got to a point where it was like, all right, we need to go. Where are we going? Are we going east or are we going west? And uh, one of the members went and visited out west, and it was one of those, come on out, the water's fine. Like, we met some people <laughs> sure. that were going to work. On top of the fact that we opened for everybody when we were in Colorado. Yeah. You know, like, we got in really good with a couple of promoters, a guy named Francois that mm-hmm. was, a, I think, is still a promoter there, and he liked us immediately in our professionalism and the fact that we put on a good show. Love that. Um, and so he brought us, we opened for everybody that came through there. Tell me, who's some? Top, oh, top I, well, this was what was crazy. Our second show was opening for Run DMC. What? Yeah. Um, he was like, listen, you guys did well in the first show. You guys want to come open up for Run DMC in Wyoming? What? Sure. Open up like you and then, and then here's Run DMC. Run DMC. What? Yeah. yeah. Dude, um, that is some major exposure there. It was crazy. It was probably a bit much for people who had only done one show. <laughs> you know what I mean? As a collective. Yo, but you first chair, yo. First chair trumpet. <laughs> first, chair, first chair drums. And now you're first chair... <laughs> 
Mike? Like first Mike? Like what are you? In well, the I rap started. Group? They wrote me into into rapping again, which was something that I did in the previous group that I was in. I was in a group previous. You were in a group a group before the percussion. I was in two different like little, but none of them were taken seriously enough to be you know to be. Who's not taking them seriously enough? You're not taking the. They the, weren't. Got it. They weren't. The group that I was in right before them, and kind of how I met some of the people that connected me to the members of the of, of the percussions. Um, well. I was rapping with one guy, this guy that I met when I was still in high school, in my mm -hmm. last year of high school there. Um, I had a friend that I was in high school with that worked with this guy during the summer yeah. at this moving company. He was like, oh, this guy raps. He's really good. You should yeah. hear him freestyle or whatever. He came around us. We sat in the car. I played a tape full of just random beats that I made, and he rapped the whole time. He did this for like hours, and I was amazed. I was like, I didn't know people could do that. <laughs> he just kept going. He had bags of rhymes, just uh -huh. whatever. And I'm going, that's dope. Um, so eventually my guy, my friend Jay, who I went to school with, he joined the military and he left the other guy, um, kind of went and did some stuff. Um, and at the end of my senior year of high school, um, there was a talent show mm -hmm. and, uh, my brother was egging me on. He's like, yo, you should enter that talent show. He's like, you could make the beat. You could rhyme. You could do this all by yourself, man. Yeah. I'm going, I don't know, man, you know, whatever. Need. But you know, he was like, I'll pay for whatever you need. And my brother paid for studio time so that I could get a professional, you know, kind of dat tape made. Sure. You know, so I could give that to him and blah, blah, blah. I wrote the rhyme and wrote the song or whatever, performed it, and I won. And uh, I get done after I perform, and I walk out, you know, outside, and there's my guy that I yeah. hadn't seen or whatever that left. You know, not the guy who joined the military, the other guy. He's like, yo. And I was like, first of all, we're in a high school. You're like six, seven years older than me. Uh -huh. How did you get in here? <laughs> like, this is, that's that's weird. Who, whose parent did you come in yeah. here with? You know, whatever. But he's like, oh, dog, we got to do this. We got to do this. Like, I know you had bars like that, whatever. And I'm like, not really, but whatever. So we started a group. Okay. What's the name of that group? That group was, ooh, that group was called Universal Styles. Universal Styles. I was in a group called Qualified Module, so, you Okay. Know. All right. Cool. Yeah. All right. I get it. Okay, you're worthy. <laughs> um, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, but we were cool. Like, we made some music. We cut, like, a couple of demos. And then over a series of events, he just did some wild stuff. And this was the beginning of me understanding what I expect in the people around me, at least as professionals, and that yeah. he was never on time. There was yeah. sometimes he was just straight no-shows. There was times where he got oddly nervous in mm -hmm. situations that I didn't expect him to get nervous. Um, we had this major audition with, you know, there was this point in time where BET were holding these, holding these auditions when Andre Harrell was like starting another label yeah. and he was holding all these auditions, these auditions in these cities. Our idea is like, all right, well, let's go to Chicago. I got family in Milwaukee. I can stay in Milwaukee. Yeah. You got family in Chicago. Let's do this audition. I remember we were rehearsed for a while. We, you know, you, we got pictures taken. We did the whole bio press, you know, kit, all that stuff. Um, went to the audition and he was like, up until that point, I was probably more the person to get nervous. I'm yeah. new to like rhyming on stage or whatever. Yeah. But by that point, I got a little bit more comfortable. And I was oddly not nervous at all. We're sitting in a room full of like like music bigwigs. Like Andre Harrell is there with other people from the label and different and whatever. And there's cameras on us. There's a line around the block of people waiting to audition. We got there super early. So we were maybe the, amongst the first 30 people in. Mm -hmm. um, we get in. We get up to perform. And it's interesting because they were cutting people off after like five, six seconds. <laughs> like, yo, 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 we ready? Like, next. Yo, like, it's like the Apollo? Yeah. The old like Sandman's coming up? Exactly. Okay. But they let us get a good, decent amount in. Okay. Before they, before they stopped us. And I remember I felt good about that. And, uh, but the whole time I was frustrated because Flex was, my man, he was super nervous. He was super nervous. And I could see it in him. <laughs> like, he was kind of just like migrating around this one area of the stage and I'm going, what are you doing? Like, yeah. What are you doing? Like, this is no, like, yeah. And so, you know, we didn't get it, you know, whatever. I went to go hang out with my, with my family back in, in, in Milwaukee for a little bit, which was good. I hadn't mm -hmm. seen my uncle in a while. And, um, you know, but the entire time he was the connect of who they were going to call to find out if we got it. Oh, geez. he never called me. I couldn't call him because I didn't have a number. Oh my goodness. I'm okay. waiting. I'm going like, okay, I'm gonna go to the airport. I don't even know if he's gonna be at the airport. Yeah. I'll go to the airport. He's standing at the gate and I'm going, yo. Yeah. And he's like, oh, what's up, dog? I'm going, don't, what's up, dog? Like, <laughs> did we get it? No, nah, I don't think we got it. Okay, where were you? Oh, I was chilling. Yeah. 
what? <laughs> like just and so no, a series like, of events and series of stuff like that ultimately got to a point where like I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. He he ended up moving back to Mississippi. I ended up joining this other group that were uh that were a group that he was working with. For sure. I ended up taking a liking to them. This is where I met Chief. We got have a it. mutual friend, Chief. We have a mutual friend. He was Chief. in that group as a kid. Got it. And okay. I went, I was brought in initially to be a producer. I got dragged into rhyme because they knew that I rhymed. So you weren't you weren't uh, excited. It didn't sound like you were excited about rapping. You keep saying dragged into because I didn't. I always viewed myself as either the DJ or just the producer. I wanted to just be the music. I you never wanted to, to make be, the music. I never wanted to be the voice. Got it. So when you're talking about making the music, you're talking about playing instruments. On either the or, track? yeah, Got it. playing instruments. I, if I was gonna to learn the DJ, I could be the DJ. But most of it was about the making of the music, the producer, uh, being you know doing production. Yeah, um, that's really what I wanted to do. Um, but because I could rhyme, mm -hmm. you know, I kept getting roped in and be like, oh, no, you should be on this song or you should do this thing or whatever. So in every single group that I was in, I kept getting roped in the rhyme. So Because you could probably rhyme. Because I could, you know, but I never thought I was, I definitely wasn't better than some of the other people in the group, but I think they liked me enough, you know, to go like, oh, you should rhyme. You, you yeah. should at least be on some songs. Or You're one of the first uh, rhyming beat makers out there? I don't yourself know if that was up one there of the first. I mean, especially <laughs> coming from the fact that I knew Pete Rock rhymed on records for but, sure, um, very well. Yeah, and very well. <laughs> um, but um, no, this carried over all the way until you know, until I met the guys in the Procussions. And so when now I, you're you're a rapper. You're no. At the time, I wanted to join the Procussions as just a producer. They knew and when that, you're producing, like what, like like what does that mean to you? Like what are you playing for? Are you making just tracks? Out of the drumming, the trumpets, all the things that you know. Well, to play at the time, on? my my earliest versions of it is I had what was called a Yama. You can Google this board and understand why it is an archaic piece of just. It's just the Yamaha PSR four hundred board. Is there's no sampling. You had to do kind of. You had to have kind of a makeshift sequencer set up in there. Like there was, you had these buttons that were like intro, fill in, main, bridge, ending. You know stuff like uh -huh. that. The thing that I figured out that you could do with these boards is you could empty those things out. And so then I could put in there whatever I wanted. Yeah, for sure. And so I started just doing that with all these little banks or whatever. The problem with that is it had no memory card. So my keyboard stayed on for 10 years <laughs> because <laughs> I just never erased anything. Yeah, yeah for and sure. And it was just, you know, whatever. Until I was able at least to like commit it to tape or something. Got it, like that. got it. You know, but that wouldn't come until much later. Um, but, uh, <laughs> You know, that was my, my initially where I started. When I met the guys in the percussions, that mm -hmm. was kind of how things got started. My man Mike, my man Mike Landers, who I'm, that's still my guy to this day, um, he's like, listen, one of the other guys has a sampler. You mm -hmm. want to come over and bring some records and just mess around with it? Cool, yeah. yeah. Came over there, and I was there for maybe like a couple hours before he had to go to work and mess around on it. And I was like, oh, this is dope. This is dope. Who was the sampler? Uh, an ASRX. Okay. Made by Insonic. Okay. Um, and I uh, messed around with that, loved it. I was like, oh, this is incredible. This is incredible. This is all I ever wanted to do. Like, I, I can use these records. What, I can add. What, what about it made you excited? Because, well, number one, the idea of being able to use samples, because the, P the Yamaha PSR 400 does not sample. Okay. It's a toy, basically. <laughs> um, I got to start somewhere, brother. You got to start somewhere. And But the thing that I will never, like, the, the Yamaha PSR board allowed me to learn how to play. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So yeah, I had to, sure. you know, figure out how to get around a keyboard. Um but uh, that uh, now I could sample. Now I could, you know, bring in the samples. But the thing that I always wanted to do was be able to sample and then build my own music around these samples. Got it. Got and that it. was the first time I was able to do that. Nice. Um, so um, did that for a couple hours at his spot, and then eventually my man Mike would get his own, mm -hmm. his own ASR. You know, his, I think his mom bought bought one for me. He invited me over. He's like, "Dude, you want to come over?" I was like, "Hell yeah!" So yeah. I came over and literally stayed up for forty eight hours. Just messing around on this machine. You were in love. I was. I was done. Okay. I was done. And you know, and just made track after track. He decided he wanted to write on some of the stuff. This group was already kind of forming, but mm -hmm. I wasn't committed to it yet. As sure. as a whatever, and you know, mostly because I was like, listen, can I just be the producer? Like, well, yeah, 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 whatever. No. But then eventually, it gets to a point that we're like, you know, because what ends up happening is that my guy, my guy Q, joins the group. Q was in it for a short time before he ended up getting sick. He ended up getting pretty sick to something that was pretty debilitating. That means that he couldn't perform. Yeah, so. um, but in the in the era that he was in, mm -hmm. um, was one of the best rappers in the group. 
incredible writer, but also knew how well I could write. And so he was like, you got to be on at least oh. like a couple. And I'm going, Q. Yeah. Uh-huh. I was so close yeah. just to being able to just see whatever. And I was like, well, all right, fine. I'll write something or whatever. And that was a wrap. Like, all sure. Because as the group kind of dwindled down from the people, you know, who were either who either had other interests or people who were maybe taking it less serious or whatever, it came down to the like basically three people. Yeah. And so now it was almost out of necessity. It was like, okay, now you have to kind of rhyme and be one of the main MCs in the group or whatever. So again, you're being pushed to... So now I'm one of the rappers. But... I was still the producer in the group. I was still, you know, at least one of the main producers. One of the mm-hmm. other members also produced. Okay. Um, but there was just kind of this understanding. It's like, oh, yeah, we're going to let you handle the at least the majority of it, you know, if you want. Got it. Uh, which, yeah, cool. Um, so, yeah, that's that's kind of how we got there. So now you're, now you're out in Los Angeles. It's 2002, 2003, mm-hmm. um, and you guys are putting together... An album, obviously, I think that's always the goal, right? Yeah, yeah, well, initially we did what we were, it was a continuation and a different version of what we were doing in Colorado, which was we just wanted to do shows. That's where we started. We just really wanted, we wanted to, to perform. Shows. We wanted to perform. We made music in the in the beginning just to be able to perform. We weren't thinking about pressing wax and doing all these so other things. So you like, let's go on tour. So let's go, like, yeah, let's, sit the let's be those guys. It wasn't until, I think, the tail end of when we lived in Colorado that we were like, oh, yeah, let's start pressing some of this stuff up on CDs and selling these things. Yeah. And, and then eventually we pressed vinyl and we got DJs to start playing them. And first time we went to CMJ, it was eye opening and it was like, oh, okay, we can yeah. do some things, like, you know, whatever. So I think when I, when I met you, you guys had already ha- had been on a tour. Okay. I it's believe possible. you had already yeah. gone on one tour at least. Okay. Maybe, you, yeah. And you had an album kind of in the works. We either had an album or we at least had maybe a single or two that was circulating. For sure. Because um, at this point, I was. Uh, now your tour manager. So I was me. I was I met you, maybe a few weeks before I was your tour manager, and we had traveled around. Yeah, what felt like thirty cities. Yeah, to do this. Now, did we meet at the Time Machine Manor? We did. Okay, Time Machine Manor. That's where we all met. Okay, okay. to talk about this. Because I, were... I can't remember if it was a party or if it was just no. Like this a... was just like a meeting to say these are the people that are going on go this tour gotcha. together. But I feel like there was a party that I came to first. It could have been. And I feel like that was the first time I met you was at the party. Okay. We didn't maybe talk in, in you know. For sure. But I feel like that was the first time I met you was at a party that was going on there. Yeah. And I think for, uh, and this is my pers- my perspective from, of you, yeah. you were kind of uh, not standoffish, like shy, shy sure. type of guy. You're not, go- you're not going to engage yes. first. You're yes. not going, you're not going to be the guy in the party. Exactly. Making the party go. Which is, which is something I had to learn over the course of my life because I don't have the best. I've inherited my father's countenance, uh-huh. which isn't the prettiest countenance. Happy, sad, <laughs> horny, hungry, whatever. They all <laughs> kind of look the same. <laughs> and so unless Yo, you get- Is he hungry or is he horny? I can't tell. I don't know. But this is, that's a very tricky line to ride. Like, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> I gave him food. I didn't know he was horny. Um, but- uh, you know, so, you know, and my countenance has kind of betrayed me my entire life and that, you know, I'm a happy person. I enjoy sure. life. I love, you know, yeah. you know, a lot of situations and experiences I've gotten to be a part of, but you don't see that, you know, whatever. And so I left it up to other people to figure out. I learned know, that. Un- unfortunately. I learned that quick. Yeah. And so we went on this tour and there was, I believe, uh, eight of you. There were the three of you in the percussions, the three guys from the t- uh, Time Machine, and there was Edon and Insight. Yep. Yeah. Um, and then me, and we traveled and by you. van. Traveled there was another guy who was driving another van, so to fit all of you guys in there. Yep. And we bounced around from city to city, so I got to know all of you uh, individually. Yeah. All your different personalities. And yeah. as a tour manager, I had never a been lot. a tour manager. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea what my real uh, job was, but I learned on the go. Right. Uh, that job is to make sure I collect your money at the end of each show, mm-hmm. and make sure I got you in and out of the hotels uh, on time to move to the next. Mm-hmm. Uh, city uh, mm-hmm. for a show. Um, so after the tour was over, I had a better sense or friendship, I would say, with many of the people um, mm-hmm. on the tour. But I also uh, got a better sense of, hey, I don't want to be a tour manager anymore. I want to go back. I need to yeah. go back to school. I need to you get got, back. You got pretty much the the, the, the best kind of lesson you could get because the tour wasn't it wasn't the roughest tour, you know, or whatever. But it was it was enough to where like okay. 
if you can go through a tour like that, uh-huh. and you still want to be a tour manager, you really want to be a tour manager. Bro, I got offered uh, to be Edon's tour manager. Really? After that tour, his mom was his manager, and she was like, Edon right. loved you as yeah. a tour manager. Will you continue? And I was like, I really appreciate you guys thinking <laughs> of me in that way. But I'm going back to school. And I, could, I couldn't <laughs> hold you. I couldn't blame you. One bit. I'm like, yeah, that's, you know, he's seen it. I like, saw I saw it all. And I was like, I got to go back to school. And I was in film school. Yeah. And we had this relationship at this point. So I was like, I'm going to I'm gonna see if I can do it. We talked about this, I think, yeah. on the tour. Well, before you get to that point, go for I, I want to go, like, because you, you brought up how many characters there were on this tour. There's a lot. And between my group, Time Machine, Insight, and Edon, that's that's a, a like that is an assortment of personalities. Oh yeah, like that. There were so many different types of personalities, and it was great <laughs> for me. Like I said, growing up a military brat, I've been on many different types of people. For sure. That felt like the United Nations of personalities in terms of like just everybody was a little different. Like everybody was, you know, different. you had us and who we were. You know, you had Time Machine. You know, you had a Time Machine. Time Machine had a Chomel, which Yo, is a, which is an entity of its own. Whole nother- <laughs> You had inside you had inside Edon with their own interest in like movies and stuff and like in like they were like they were their own thing. Yeah. And it was great. I loved it. Um, but I remember thinking like, okay, like here's these here's this guy, here's this guy Hilton. And we, up until that point we hadn't had a lot of conversations. Mm-hmm. But I remember it, and it's gonna sound random. Please. The moment that clicked for me that I was like, Oh, that's my guy. Okay. Because when you're driving, you take turns driving. Mm-hmm. For everybody who's who's who started from the bottom and you drive your own minivans or nine passenger vans, you take turns driving, assholes. Like you don't <laughs> let one person drive the whole time. Um, so you take turns driving, and whenever it's my turn to drive, whoever's turn it is to drive, they control the radio. For sure. Between them and the person in the passenger seat, because the person in the passenger seat is co-captain. Yep. Um, but usually it's up to the person driving. He gets first say. And so we heard all different types of music. People yeah. were playing all different kinds. Of, I think that was the first time I heard Steffi BL. Um, and, you know, <laughs> Those of you who don't know, Steffi, <laughs> Steffi, BL, <laughs> Steffi BL is a character I created for myself back in college, and I would do some uh, uh, singing. Yeah. Uh, I might have talked about this. Steffi BL, Steffi BL wanted to be R. Kelly, but Steffi BL is who R. Kelly became. <laughs> Whoa, <laughs> <yo>. <laughs> If that sums it up for you at all, yikes! Um, okay, but okay. anyway, uh, but the uh, <laughs> there was a moment where it was my turn to drive, and I was really into the first Van Hunt album. I don't know how many people are familiar, still familiar with Van Hunt, besides the fact that he's with Halle Berry now. But um, he makes incredible music. He's always made incredible music, and I remember he he has an, he had an album, and the first song on the album I just loved. It was a song called Dust. Mm-hmm. And we were driving. And usually, if I'm listening to music in my headphones, there are songs that I would play maybe two, three times in a row when I love the song. I had just gotten this album. So this was a song that I newly loved and was like, I really like this song. And I'm driving in this van with these other individuals. All different characters. All different characters. If I start this song over right when it finishes, that can't happen. And then from the back seat, you were sitting in kind of one of the middle seats and you go, Stro, can you play that one again? And I'm like... <laughs> <laughs> mm. <laughs> it's like my guy, and hey, I was man. like, I was like, that's my dude. That's my dude forever. That's this, how it works. I get to listen to this song twice in the car. Like I would have had to be in the headphones, other, other than that, you know. But that in like a collection of conversations, I think I I got, you know, I was like, oh, this is a different dude. And again, like I said, I like meeting people who are a little different, who are a little bit to the left. You seem to be into different things than yeah. Than the average, definitely from the average person that I might have met from Baltimore. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like I was kind of like, oh yeah, this guy is. I wouldn't have pegged that at all. Like, For sure. If you just had to tell me, there's a tall black dude from Baltimore. I kind of went, okay. I feel like I need to protect myself <laughs> from mentally, physically. <laughs> but yeah, man. I mean, I had I had met all of you guys, and I was just like, I could tell who. Um, I could. Create a relationship beyond the tour with, mm-hmm. um, and who like this was my moment with them, mm-hmm. um, and a lot of those folks uh, from the tour I still talk to today. Uh, Chomel is one of my favorite individuals. Word. Like I talk about you, Chomel. Um, I, I love Rez uh, yeah. as well. And, like the people that I like, I had like deep relationships yeah. with. Um, uh, still, I guess to this day, mm-hmm. um, and I'm gonna fast forward. I guess our story a bit because here is kind of where we were because that tour was such 
uh, I was with you all the time. Mm -hmm. And and after the tour, I was back in school and I wanted to focus on making films. Like mm -hmm. filmmaking was my thing. And I love music. Mm -hmm. uh, I love music videos, commercials. And I wanted to make a music video with you guys. And I got this opportunity to do so. And again, like I knew all your personalities. Like I know that some, some people were uh, a bit more... Uh, um, aggressive about their wants mm -hmm. um, and I had to understand and, and, and navigate that mm -hmm. and I knew who, like like who you were mm -hmm. and how to kind of navigate with you mm -hmm. and I think the tour helped me with that when it came to uh, when it came to now shooting or uh, having you in this video right so when we're creating this video I'm seeing this group that is now touring in Tokyo um, you're touring with these big artists mm -hmm. Um, I think at this point you were touring with uh, maybe a Tribe Called Quest. Yeah, had that happened yet? At that point, I think. At, okay. At, I think by the time I was shooting these videos, like that was like okay. on the cusp of happening. Okay. Or you had already done this, <clears throat> okay. but you were you were in my eyes a a really big like you were, and there were and on tour there was a bit of a, you know, like some some feathers got ruffled a, a bit here because. You were the headliner, I felt, in oh, a lot right. of these stops. Right. And I had no idea who you were. And we would go to these shows. And I'm like, these people are all here to see, really, to see the percussions. Mm -hmm. Like, they want to see the percussions. And I was like, this is a huge, this is a, they're, like, they're a big deal. Mm -hmm. And then you started to get these, um, I was hearing about these shows uh, headlining. Or um, maybe you're, you're just co-touring with a Tribe Called Quest at mm -hmm. this point. Maybe you're um, on a tour with The Roots. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, but it was just like, I would see you here and there uh, just because we were friends and things would come together. At this point, and I'm really moving the story because mm -hmm. I had shot this video for you. Um, I thought it was great. You guys all gave me praises if it was great, yeah. but you knew me. You were like, yeah, yeah. I, "We got, let's give them this. <laughs> let's give this yeah, from jump when I, when I knew that that was like a thing, when they were like, oh, Hilton wants to shoot a video. That word. Let's I go. love that. You know, just because I liked. At that point, I hadn't seen much of what you had done visually, but mm -hmm. like I, like you know, like you said, I knew the person. I knew that you know the vision or whatever. You know, I had heard just some of like even just ideas about other projects, not necessarily yeah. anything related to us or whatever. So I was already in from a creative standpoint. For sure, I appreciate that trust, and I mean, and I thought it turned out really well. Yeah, and I just knew that I was like, this band is going places because that's what it was. It mm -hmm. felt that way. You're connecting with all these really big bands mm -hmm. um, and groups and like going on tour with them. And I moved back to Baltimore at some point um, around uh, 07, 08. And um, I was just doing my thing uh, and seeing you guys develop. I believe you guys were still uh, a band in 08, mm -hmm. 09. Um, and at a certain point, I moved back to LA around 2009. I'm back in LA to, um, 2009. This is my second stint in LA, mm -hmm. and uh, I moved. I move in around 2010 with uh, one of your um, per percussion bandmates, mm -hmm. Rez. We're mm -hmm. all friends. And where were you at this point? Because was I don't think the band was together at this point in 2010. Well, we went through a couple different like because you know there was a point when Rez left. Mm -hmm. And then it was just me, me and the other person left. And then we also cycled in different DJs. Um, so it went through like kind of different like versions or whatever. But there was a point where things stopped, like, like almost came to a complete halt. And, and being in the percussions was your major source of income? Yeah, that was for me kind of, you know, I, you know, and this was the thing, like, I don't think, um, you know, for me, like if I was going to make it, make it. What was your like, idea of making it? Was going to be with that band. It was going to be. But what was the making it part? But like just you the, as just, a producer, rapper or. Well, in the context of what I was doing, which at that point was both being a producer and a rapper. And the um, percussions was it. Like that was going to be your train to success. Or yeah, that was going to, in, in my mind, I was like, oh yeah, I'm going to be with these guys forever. We're going to make music. We're going to put out records. We're going to tour and do this for the rest of our lives in whatever sure. capacity, whether we're signed to major labels or we continue to do this independently hopefully in a way that you know is fruitful for everyone that everybody's able to take care of themselves and if yeah. they want raise families and buy homes and do all that you know whatever that was kind of what i saw but as you know as things kind of went on 
you know, in, in, in relationships kind of deteriorate. And I, wanna, I don't even want to necessarily say deteriorate because there's this thing that happens when you start a group when you're young. Mm -hmm. You're also growing as an individual, For sure. as a human being. So you're figuring out things that you like and you don't like. Uh, you're changing. Yeah. And you have a group full of individuals that are doing that all at doing the same, the same. time. Yep. Also while trying to maintain this business that they've started together. Yeah. This career that they've started together. Yeah. And so, you know, all that stuff mixed together and you're in each other's face all, mm -hmm. all of the time. Like some people make it, some people don't. You know what I mean? And, you know, we got to a point where it became difficult. And, you know, the first, you know, I remember when, when you know, when Rez left. And Rez left for different reasons. I remember, <clears throat> you know, the what your passion is is the thing that will wake you up in the middle of the night, you know. Facts. And, and we would be touring and we'd be sitting in the van, uh, sitting in the van or whatever. And I remember I would wake up and, and I would see, you know, uh, you know, I would see my guy Jay writing down some lyrics. I would see Rez drawing mm. or, you know, whatever. Yeah. Maybe he's got his camera on. He's filming mm -hmm. what's going on outside the window or whatever. I had a little vocal recorder that I would kind of beatbox into if I had like little yep. ideas here and there or whatever. But I remember it came to a point to where it became harder to get Rez to kind of like finish, you know, writing sometimes or whatever. And I remember I told him, I was like, dude, if you want to just go and be an artist and be a photographer and just do like, that's your passion. That's the thing that wakes clear. you up in the middle of the night. It's, yeah. I see it. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, it's like, I don't think any of us want to force you to, to do this, you know, mm -hmm. whatever. Because the thing was, it became the the music, like you said, like we were getting busier. We were getting yeah. bigger opportunities. That was taking time away from the other things that he wanted to do. Mm -hmm. We were doing, me and Jay were doing exactly what we wanted to do. Yeah, you were, you were in your dream. Exactly. You were exactly. living your dream at this moment. This was like maybe a version of Reza's dream, but, yeah. you know, not the whole thing. So, you know, it got to a point to where, you know, it was like, listen, if you want to leave... You know, whatever, and he pondered it. He did the responsible thing. Responsible yeah. thing. He thought about it for a while, and then came back. He's like, "Yeah, I think I think I'm out." And I'm like, "Okay." And it was, you know, it, it, as much as it was cool, like it, at least I can't speak for Jay, but for me, I was like, "Okay, cool." And I also lived with Rez at the time. We Got we, it. we had an apartment, so we talked a whole lot. Um, but it still was weird, and it still kind of sucked because you had to kind of reconfigure some things. For sure. He was obviously a part of some of the material that you performed. Now we had to do kind of truncated versions of some of these oh, things. Oh, man, got and, it. And, you know, the show, the, even just the energy on stage, like there's a spacing that happens with yeah. three people. And now you all of a sudden have to account for, okay, when at least for me, and the way that I've always thought about performing is that every piece of the stage needs to be accounted for by a person. For sure. You know what I mean? For sure. And with three people, it's easy. There's a little... Yeah. Left and a right. Yep. You know what I mean? Now all of a sudden it's just two of us. And I'm you going like, okay. And and Jay was was a, a shot out of a cannonball every night. So every night. Like, that's Jay's energy. Yeah. And so I was like, okay, I gotta join a gym. I gotta get my <laughs> cardio up. Because now I gotta be when he's left, I gotta be right. Yeah. And vice versa. And I gotta so that means I have to keep up with him. Because you, you play I mean? pretty chill as far as your performance. Yeah, goes. I was able to like kind of maintain like it wasn't that I was just like, you know, a statue on stage when Rez was a part of the group. Mm -hmm. But I didn't have to like I could meander and move around without having to be so aware and have to For move sure. so quickly. So, you know, that the dynamic changed a little bit in yeah. the in the performance or whatever. But you know, we kind of didn't miss a step. We did a couple shows and it felt a little weird mm -hmm. and we kind of got used to it. We were able to actually kind of like add some new things, you know, and, and kind of branch out a little bit. So it was good. And everybody was happy when it came down to it. And I, and I was, I lived with Rez probably another year or two after, mm -hmm. after he left or whatever. So we stayed cool and, you know, I would come home from these tours and, and he'd be at home. He's like, I was, you know, I was how friends. was it? I was yeah. okay. I was whatever. And See, he he knows what that lifestyle is like. Yeah, yeah. He yeah. wanted to follow up with you. And those are the things you it. can't. To this day, I tell people, you know, like the memories that I made with those guys is something that I can't, I can't really articulate or I can't really share or like you know share the stories in the same manner that I can with them because they were there. Like For that, sure, that's something that I share specifically with them. I can sit there and I can tell you about these tours that we yeah. did in Europe and. But you don't. You're not gonna remember that we're all huddled around a space heater in the middle, in the backstage of this, this sure. place called Clermont Ferrand, which is the only reason I remember the name of that city is it's because it's the coldest I've ever been in my life. Wow. <laughs> um, and everybody kind of remembers that city for the same reason. Um, but yeah, you have these memories with these people that are very specific, and you know, and you're kind of bonded 
for that reason. You know, of the, course. Like, you're one of, like, those people, that they're one of two or three people that know what that memory well, is. Well, I think beyond that, you're bonded because you created this art together that sure. will always exist and it's still out there today, right? Right, right. You are who you are and you have your idea of yourself mm -hmm. and then people see you a certain way. Mm-hmm. Like when I said when I first met you, you were in this amazing band. I know who you are. I understand you as this very talented individual. Mm -hmm. I see you as a creative, as an artist. I understand and know what your dream is. Mm -hmm. I saw you in this band that I was like, that band is like up there with uh, a tribe, um, up there with any of the hip hop bands out there that are touring and making good music. Mm -hmm. And I'm now living with Rez, mm -hmm. uh, who you lived with mm -hmm. at a certain time. And I see you come into our, an, into our home and into this apartment. I guess it's a house that we're sharing different rooms in. And you are wearing like a button-up shirt t tucked into your pants and a tie. <laughs> and I'm like, who the fuck is this? <laughs> who, who, what? Bro, like a piece of me broke because I was like, this isn't... My guy. Yeah. This isn't what I know him to want his life to be like. Right. And now he's being forced into this situation because of of the things that life throws at us. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um. So I saw you. and You were like, yeah, I'm I'm working at a, like at a at a temp agency, and I'm like, what? Why? <laughs> right. Like, why are you doing that? Right. Um. And why were you doing that? Well, because we weren't doing anything. We weren't doing anything, and I needed to make ends meet. I, you know, me and Rez still lived in an apartment. I needed to pay rent. I needed to eat. I needed to pay bills, and you do what you need to do. Yeah. And he was like, listen, all right, I'm going to sign up for some tip agencies, you know. Um, so how, yeah. long were, how long were you doing this? That wasn't it. The first, that particular instance, of that, that wasn't that long. Okay. That wasn't that long. You happened to catch me in, a, in kind of a short season of that, because um, we would eventually reconvene, at least start touring again. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> um, we would go on kind of an, another kind of hiatus for a while where we didn't do anything. Um, and, uh, you know, fast forwarding, you know, we would eventually in 2013, me and, me and Jay would get together to make another album, which would be the last album that we did. Okay. And it took some convincing on my part. I wasn't convinced that it was something that we should do. You know, mostly just because I was like, okay, I feel like the Procussions as a name is attached to who we were years ago. Let's just yeah. do something new and different. For sure. But, you know, Jay found value in, in the fact that we still had a fan base. There were still people who liked the pros, who liked yeah. the Procussions or whatever. And, and you know, and I eventually agreed. And, you know, I liked the idea of being able to even perform some of the old routine, you know, the old music and stuff. And we, 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 uh, we crowdfunded an album. Um, got more than we asked for, which was great. Um, and uh, yeah, eventually started hitting the road again. And we kind of almost exclusively in Europe. I think we signed with a we signed with a French label, and uh, and which was great for me because France was kind of always low key one of my favorite places. I love like that. When, yeah. we, when we toured abroad, like it was, you know, I loved the culture. I loved the people there. I had great experiences with people there. I loved the art scene there. Obviously, for and, sure. Um, it was just, you know, it's, it's, it's all the things that people talk about in terms of Paris and, and, and French culture and more, you yeah. know, depending yeah. on where you went. And we were very fortunate that we got to be in the outskirts of, um, of some of the places that people normally go. For and, sure. Um, but, um, yeah, we did that for a while and then, um, we hit another bump in the road and this one wouldn't end up being more permanent. So once that happens... You guys break in because I think in 2013, this is around the same time where I well, was. Well, first of all, we toured for like two years after that. Like, so we oh, were wow. together for a minute. Like, Got we worked it. that so album for another year or two at least. Got it. And then you were just like, this isn't working for us as a group. Mm -hmm. so you, you part it. And at this point, you're just, you're, you're doing, because at this point, I think I was, because for me, I was like, there's no way, and this is for my own. I guess perspective outside of what you were already doing. Mm -hmm. When I saw you temping, I was like, "Well, shit." When I, whenever I have a video that needs music, mm -hmm. I'm gonna reach out to you and try to yeah, hire you right. to create music for a commercial or yeah. whatever thing I'm doing. Yeah. Um, so at this point, I was like trying to give you as much of those jobs as possible yeah. that that will come up. 
and then in 20, I think 2013, I was, I would see you in LA cause I lived in LA, but I moved to New Orleans in 2014. Mm -hmm. And at this point I hadn't, I hadn't seen you at this point. I wouldn't see you again in person for a really long time. Right. So you're now out of this band, mm -hmm. right? Is now you are back. Are you back temping or now are you like, how are you still doing? How are you still keeping your feet on the path of this dream? Or or did you at some point well, feel like you're giving this up and you're going to now be this different version of yourself? Well, because I had so much, like I said, because I had so much tied up in this group, in this band, mm -hmm. I was like, oh, well, that's it. I'm done. Like, that's that was going to be... The You're done that, being a musician. Yeah, it's like I'm done. Like, it's like because anything I would have to do meant that I would have to start over. Because mm -hmm. at that point, I couldn't see myself doing anything by myself. I didn't have enough confidence to do anything completely on my own. So it was always going to have to be a part of something else. Yeah. If it was going to have to be a part of something else, that means that I was going to have to start from 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 level one in terms of getting to know somebody For and sure. being able to trust them and to know not only just how talented they were, but could we be in the trenches together, you know, yeah. and like all, all the things that you need to do to be around people that you work with. So I didn't see that happening. So yeah. I was kind of like, you know, and I remember I went through like this rough era of like, you know, I was sleeping on my man's couch mm -hmm. and living off of, you know, you know, ramen, 99 cent crazy bread from Little Caesars and, and bags of marshmallows if I wanted, if I had a sweet tooth. You want to touch that tooth? Yeah. I want to um, touch that tooth. How old were you then? Uh, at this time? Probably, I don't know, maybe late 20s. Late 20s. Yeah. Chasing this dream. Yeah. You know, well, I did, at that point, I didn't even feel like I was chasing it anymore. It was just kind of like... I was You're like, giving up? I was just kind of living in what was left. You know, it was like, so every once in a while, I would get hit up by somebody, maybe do a remix. Mm -hmm. I would get up by every once in a while to maybe come do like a beat battle situation or something yeah. like that. But I wasn't making music for the purposes of releasing anything or you know, being active in that way. You know, I lived with my guy, Mike, and they were still making music. So that kept me alive because he was like, he's like, you want to make? I was like, yeah, sure, let's make some music. What are you thinking? You know, yeah. whatever. And, and that kind of kept me, you know, kind of alive up here. Um, but um, the, you know, it, the, probably the lowest one, and I remember, like, I, I cut my hair. You remember I had big hair. Yeah, man. I had Always this, had big hair. Yeah, I had this huge hair. You know, with this little soul patch that you know that that like divided me in half from my, from my chin <laughs> down, uh huh. <laughs> um, and uh, and I cut all that off, and I Had remember to shed some weight. And I remember I posted that picture on Facebook. I was like, yeah, I got a job at a temp agency, and I'm doing this, and you know, it's a nine to five, and I'm gonna get off my man's couch and give me a place to live, and you know, start being responsible. So I, you felt like before this point. You were just living irresponsibly. You were just living like a child. It wasn't that I, I didn't feel that like while I was doing it, but it felt irresponsible to try to keep doing it Got because it. I saw the way that it failed. You know what I mean? And and I had no plan B. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. the, it was that or nothing. For sure. You know, and I could. And Jay was the same way. I don't think Jay had a plan B either. Jay was just always better at facilitating something. Like mm -hmm. Jay, Jay's work ethic and Jay's, you know. Jay was just built differently than I was. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I remember I posted a picture of my haircut and talking about being excited about getting this job or whatever, and I get a call from my brother. Mm -hmm. You know, me and my brothers are about, me and my brother are about two years apart. He's two years younger than me. Um, so our dynamic is barely big brother, little brother, mm -hmm. um, but it is. Um, and I remember, you know, we're talking like a little bit, and, and he gets to a point in the conversation where he's like, what are you doing? I'm like, what do you mean? No. Yeah. You know, it's like, well, I'm being responsible. He's like, yeah, 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 I hear all that. But he's like, you're going to work at a temp agency. You're going to sit behind a desk. You. Yeah. And I was like, yeah. What, like, and at this point, I'm kind of irritated. I was like, what, do you, what else do you want me to do? He was like, listen, if it's not working with the clientele, the people that you have around, get a different clientele, the people. Find some other people. He's mm -hmm. like, you're an artist, bro. Like, that's, you're not, like, yeah. I, it's weird for me to even think about you sitting behind a desk and doing anything where you're not allowed to. <laughs> Uh -huh. You know, be creative and whatever, and, and yeah. just listen to somebody else tell you what to do. That doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah, and you know, it was a kick in the pants from the little brother. You know what I mean? To be like, sure. oh, yo, right. I mean, we uh, uh, look. I, you're, you're a little bit older than me, but when I met you, that's how I felt. Right. I felt like little brother, big brother, but I saw, I saw you. 
mm-hmm. as like I I wasn't on I was your manager on your tour. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? You I was shooting a video for you for your music, your art that you're out there making. See, your this, tour. Is, this is what was interesting about my mindset. Like none of that felt like mine. Yeah, but you're you were again probably in, to your brother, to people who know you, who are close to you. You were a fucking rock star, bro. I never saw myself that way. But others did. And that's where your brother was but, coming from. It's like, yo, this is not... Right. But again, would, it's not you to us. Right. It would take me years. And I'm, by years, I mean over the course of the last few years to get to a point to where I understood and was able to sit and digest the way that other people saw me mm-hmm. and then actually see myself in that way. So when you were deciding to transition into working or taking off the uh, cape of being this rock star to us <laughs> and you were going to put on this tie, cut your hair. What did you see yourself as then? I just saw myself as just, you know, somebody who was trying to be in a, become an adult. So this was, this was this going to be adulting to yeah, you. Yeah, like, I think I was, started to look at everything I had been doing as like, oh, that was cool to do when you're young and you're a kid and you just kind of chase dreams and yeah. or whatever. This is real life. You know, Got you, it. you, you, you know, if I ever want to be taken seriously and a lot of it was about that. I think, you know, I think I spent a lot of my life trying to be taken seriously because I was, you know, um, not only just being a musician and, and knowing how people just, you know, cause everybody in LA was a rapper, a DJ, yeah. a producer or whatever, blah, blah, blah. To the point where it just, it made my skin crawl to have to tell somebody that. For sure. You know, meeting a girl for the first time. You know, what are you doing? I don't I'm a rapper. I'm in a rap group. I'm like, oh, really? For sure. You know, um, uh, I didn't. Ha- I didn't see myself the way that yeah. other people saw me. I didn't view myself as even, you know, a successful artist. You know, yeah. in some regards, because I'm looking at these other people who are successful artists. You know, and being in L.A., we saw our friends becoming famous. We were friends with Aloe Black. We were friends with people from Pac Div and all these other people, mm-hmm. and and we watched them getting signed and putting out singles and blowing up. And we're going. We're still touring, and that's yeah. and listen. I wasn't going like for me at least. I wasn't going like oh, I wish we were signed. I was, I was fine. Like I said, doing what we were doing, but you know, at a certain point, you do you do start to feel feel like you're playing in the JV league where everybody else is going pro for sure. And you can only do that for so long before you feel like all right, I should probably move on to doing something that's going to sustain my life for the rest of my life. You know, that. as an adult, you know what I mean. So that's that was my mindset moving forward. You know. <laughs>